Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. As usual, there is a frenzy of activity going on at Starbase as SpaceX prepares for the fourth test flight of Starship. However, how close are we really to that fourth test flight? Is SpaceX as prepared to go for another flight as we have been led to believe? Is the FAA satisfied? And if not, how long is it going to be before we actually see a flight? And more importantly, how long is it going to be before Starship is actually operational and capable of putting human beings on the surface of the moon. And in related news, it appears that NASA has finally begun to realize that the third quarter of 2026 is a completely unrealistic time frame to expect Starship to be able to put human beings on the moon, and they are beginning to make changes to Artemis 3. None of this is official, but it's almost certain to happen. Happen. And NASA is considering two options. One is a very good option, and the other is completely idiotic. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Bulletin. I haven't actually talked about Starship, at least in a non-live stream setting for a while, and I think it's important that we talk about the current status of Starship and when the next launch is likely to be, and more importantly, what this means for programs like Artemis. As many of us have probably heard lately, it seems that Starship is on the verge of lifting off again, that we are in the final preparation phases. We've had static fires of both the booster and the upper stage, and everything is looking very optimistic, and so we should be expecting the fourth flight of Starship sometime in early May, just as Elon said would happen. But... Unfortunately, as always, and I hate to always be the one to bring these sorts of things up, but given that nobody else really seems to talk about it, I think it's important that we do talk about these things simply because it's reality. The FAA has certain requirements as to what's going to have to be done before the fourth flight takes place. And the first and most important thing is the mishap report for the third flight needs to be submitted. And as of yesterday, at least according to my contacts at the FAA, there's no confirmation that this report has been submitted yet. And once again, that shouldn't really surprise us, because there were a lot of things that happened, fantastic things that happened in the third flight that were still pretty unique. Things that had never really happened before with the Starship flight, that is to say, out in space, Starship tried to conduct a number of maneuvers, tried to execute a re-entry, all of those things being very different than anything Starship has done up to this point, and all of that process needs to be analyzed thoroughly, and also we need to determine what is necessary, what sort of steps need to be taken to try to make sure that that doesn't happen again, and and that Starship carries out a completely successful orbital flight test the next time. All of that is kind of complicated, and it means it could take a bit longer before this flight can actually take place, because the FAA not only needs to receive the mishap report, then they need to study it, submit a list of corrective actions. Now, granted, most of that is probably happening already, the FAA likes to carry out this process kind of side by side with the mishap report, so a lot of these corrective actions are probably in process already, but still, once the mishap report is actually submitted, we have never seen a situation to where a launch takes place a week afterwards or two weeks. It's a process that actually takes at least a month, if not longer, which means we could be seeing a launch sometime in early June. And of course, that gives rise to other questions. Because we are less than two and a half years away from the projected date where Starship will go from where it is now to being able to put human beings on the surface of the moon. 
and NASA is finally beginning to realize that that simply isn't possible. Something that all of us really knew all along, that Starship just wouldn't be ready to put people on the moon by late 2026, that it would take a substantially longer period of time, and so therefore, some changes need to be made to Artemis III. Two options have been presented behind the scenes already at NASA. One of these is a really good option, one that I've brought up in the past. The other is mind-bogglingly stupid. So this may be the most complicated aspect of the mishap report that SpaceX has had to work on yet. What happened with the re-entry process, and how do we prevent this from happening again? This is how a Starship re-entry is supposed to go. Starship presents its heat shield during a belly flop into the atmosphere, and of course the heat shield takes all of the punishment. This is, of course, not what happened during the third flight of Starship. Instead, there definitely seemed to be some control issues going on even before Starship hit the atmosphere. In addition to that, Starship shed a considerable number of heat tiles the moment it started to hit the atmosphere, indicating that many of the problems that we've been observing with Starship as far as the heat shield is concerned may still be lingering. And this is something that needs to be completely rectified before we can actually have what is considered a successful orbital flight test. In other words, a flight test that the FAA is going to be satisfied with and won't require a mishap report. And this could be a rather complicated process. We've seen heat tiles being replaced and modified out at Starbase, and until SpaceX properly identifies the control issues they experienced both during the orbital trajectory and during the re-entry, and also the problems with the heat shield, and what sort of corrective actions are likely to solve this problem sufficiently so Starship can at least attempt a soft landing in the Indian Ocean the next time, the FAA isn't really going to permit Starship from lifting off again. Why is this? Well, it's because of safety. Even though the orbital trajectory of Starship should safely carry it into the middle of the Indian Ocean regardless of what happens, if there are malfunctions with the thrusters, for example, and it has been suggested that the coal gas thrusters may indeed have malfunctioned, well, have a look at what might happen if we had an early re-entry. As you can see, Starship's trajectory takes it right over Africa. And if Starship were to execute an early re-entry at that point, we might have big chunks of stainless steel raining down over South Africa, which would be very unfortunate indeed. Therefore, whatever sort of control issues SpaceX was experienced with Starship during the flight, well, all of that needs to be properly addressed and corrected before the FAA is going to feel comfortable enough to allow Starship to fly again. Now, if all of these safety precautions seem a bit extreme to you, keep in mind we are one disaster away from the Starship program being completely sabotaged. If we have any injuries or God forbid deaths associated with the Starship test, especially in another country, that could cause an unbelievable delay to the program. Perhaps as long as one to two years before anyone is going to let Elon fly this thing thing again. So it's very important that if there are any problems that were experienced during the flight that need to be rectified for public safety, then these corrective actions need to be undertaken. And by the way, if you are interested in the FAA's philosophy when it comes to these types of issues, then I would strongly recommend that you watch my exclusive interview with Kelvin Coleman, the assistant administrator of the FAA, and the guy pretty much in charge of this entire process to get the FAA side of things. It's very easy to criticize a government agency if you don't actually listen to their side of the argument, and I have to say it is pretty compelling. But let's get on to NASA. 
how is NASA reacting to all of this? Because it's becoming more and more obvious, as I've been saying for quite some time, that even though Starship is undoubtedly the future when we're talking about colonizing the moon, when we're talking about taking large amounts of payload to the moon and hundreds of people to the moon, as far as Artemis 3 is concerned, Starship is highly unlikely to be ready to put human beings on the surface of the moon by the third quarter of 2026. It may be a lot longer than that. And in the meantime, the Artemis program needs to move forward somehow. And this is precisely what NASA has in mind. According to a recent article in Ars Technica, behind the scenes, NASA is is now beginning to implement some changes with Artemis 3 or proposing alternatives. And as I said before, one of these alternatives is a very good one, one that I've talked about before, and that is to simply fly Orion and SLS out to the moon, dock with the Lunar Gateway. Of course, the Lunar Gateway would need to be assembled before that could be carried out. However, the first modules for the Lunar Gateway are nearing completion as I'm recording this, and they can be deployed by a Falcon Heavy. That's the plan with those, so as long as the power and propulsion element and the halo module are deployed for the lunar gateway this mission could be carried out sls simply carries orion out to lunar orbit or rather to the rectilinear halo orbit that lunar gateway is going to occupy dock with lunar gateway and the astronauts stay on the space station perhaps for several weeks carrying out a long-term and in my opinion important mission to determine what's going to happen to astronauts during long exposure to interplanetary space because the area occupied by the lunar gateway well that is essentially interplanetary space radically different from the international space station out in cislunar orbit these astronauts are going to be exposed to solar radiation, cosmic rays, pretty much everything the universe has to throw at them without any protection from Earth's magnetic field. It's important that we start getting information about that, and that's one of the main reasons that we are building the Lunar Gateway in the first place. And there are other tasks that could be carried out on the Lunar Gateway as well. For example, perhaps real-time control of rovers on the lunar surface. Keep in mind that assuming the CLPS program goes as planned, there's going to be a number of rovers deployed on the lunar surface from some of the later CLPS missions. And perhaps these rovers could be controlled in real time from orbit something that has been talked about frequently as a potential advantage for the Lunar Gateway, the ability to have direct line of sight and direct communication to these rovers for a great proportion of the time to where these sorts of things could be maneuvered by the astronauts. And in addition to that, you could also have real-time construction of lunar habitats utilizing the Lunar Gateway as a control platform without having to put astronauts on the surface of the moon. So lots of different potential objectives to be carried out in this Artemis 3 mission if you use the Lunar Gateway. I said there was another alternative, a stupid alternative, and that is to fly both the Orion and Lunar Starship to Earth orbit to have the vehicles dock with one another, to then transfer the astronauts from Orion over to Lunar Starship, and then to separate the vehicles again. Fly about with Lunar Starship for a while, testing the control systems, testing the ship, and then simulate a docking again with Orion, perhaps from a distance from about 100 miles, because that's precisely what the Apollo astronauts did back on Apollo 9. Now, this sounds like a fantastic idea, doesn't it? I mean, after all, that's what the Apollo astronauts did, and it was very important that they carried out that mission because it allowed them to get used to the LEM, to test the control systems, to determine if there might be any problems in the future, and from a distance of 100 miles, they carried out an approach to the Apollo module, simulating a return from the moon. So this seems to be a very logical thing to do in preparation for our return to the moon, right? Right? Well, 
this isn't Apollo, not even remotely. Here's what's different about carrying out this sort of mission and why it doesn't make a damn bit of sense. By the time Lunar Starship is actually ready to go to the moon, Lunar Gateway is almost certainly going to be in operation. And even if it isn't, the current Artemis plan is for Lunar Starship to dock with Orion once. Just one time. And then after that, Lunar Starship will be docking with Lunar Gateway. There is absolutely no point in simulating a docking procedure between Lunar Starship and Orion if that docking procedure is unlikely to take place. What might make a little bit more sense is to have perhaps a Crew Dragon dock with Lunar Starship and then to fly Lunar Starship around in Earth orbit for a while, again, getting the astronauts familiar with the control systems, etc., the way the Apollo 9 astronauts did, and then dock with Crew Dragon again. Because if you use Orion for a purpose like this, it is an unbelievable waste. We will be spending $4 billion to not go to the moon. Once again, this isn't Apollo. NASA doesn't have Apollo's budget. If this were to be carried out, this type of mission, that means the earliest we would see another SLS mission would be another year and another $4 billion later, whereas Apollo 9 was followed up by Apollo 10 and Apollo 11 in a mere four months. That's how many Saturn V rockets were launching back during the Apollo era, and that is how few SLS rockets have been approved for the Artemis program until Congress actually starts feeding the kind of money into NASA that they were getting back in the 60s and early 70s. We cannot be wasting expensive SLS flights on these kinds of relatively useless missions. As I said before, this isn't Apollo 9. This isn't the sort of docking that's going to be taking place over and over again during the course of the Artemis missions. It's going to happen once at most, and then after that, it's going to be dockings with the Lunar Gateway. Orion will never dock with Lunar Starship again, assuming it ever does. I can't believe that NASA is even considering this possibility. A Lunar Gateway mission makes so much more sense. Sure, again, perhaps experimenting with Lunar Starship in orbit does make a little bit of sense as well, but not docking Orion with Lunar starship that is just a needless waste i certainly hope that nasa gets a clue as to what the best option is and i hope they make a decision fairly soon because we absolutely need an artemis 3 mission in 2026 we need to see tangible progress with all of this before congress begins wondering what they're really spending billions of taxpayer dollars on in the first place I would like to thank Marina Middleton and Andrew Roberts, my latest Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for supporting this channel. We have climbed to over 45% of what we need in order to support future trips to Boca Chica, to the upcoming Sierra Space Dream Chaser launch, and also the first ever vertical commercial launch from Western Europe. And that's going to be happening at Saxaford and Rocket Factory Augsburg in the summer. Your support makes all of this possible, makes it possible for me to bring you coverage of these events on the spot. If you'd like to become part of this community, all the details are in the description. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.